So uh, just to be clear, I'm not talking about data. Um, you explicitly asked me to talk about something else. So we use Python for lots of things, and I will just give you the link at some point where you can find this notebook and do some data analysis. But I will talk about the instrument, so it's going to be different. But it's interesting. Uh, before we start, um, so I'm doing a lot of outreach talks these days, as you can imagine. Uh, so we usually go to schools and uh, science fairs, and um, we want to have, especially the kids, to take something home and then show their family and friends. So we started to develop uh, some apps because that's what kids want nowadays, and I want you actually to do this now yourself. So that's a free app. It doesn't have any ads. It doesn't track you. It doesn't collect any data. So it's uh, very safe. So if you download that thing on an Android or iPhone, uh, it doesn't do very much. Uh, so it's very simple. It just has a webcam, uh, well, both of them. And then you see uh, a black hole uh, that you can move around. So if I switch the camera, then I can just do that with you guys. And then you take a picture and you tweet it, OK? And then you might win one of these prizes. <laughs> so that's a good age uh, indicator for the audience. When I do this with the 50-year-old, nothing happens. If I do this with kids, it's amazing. So let's see <laughs> how, how you do, OK? So you have 40 minutes to get this downloaded and start taking pictures. Everybody try it. <laughs> OK, so why am I here? Um, so I work for the LIGO project, and um, we have been in the news. So earlier this year, that was on the 12th of uh, February, so this is a, the date of the event. But these newspaper front pages are from the 12th of February. So we've been on the front page with the science projects almost everywhere on the planet. So that's a bit unusual. Um, why was that? Well, on that day, we published a research paper, um, and this is it. So that's in uh, Physical Review Letters, one of the uh, better journals. And it's about the first detection of gravitation waves. So people thought, that's great, amazing, and important. And I would like to tell you a little bit about that today. Um, so I, I have two parts of the talk. In the first part, I will just talk about the instrument and the detection itself, give you a bit of physics. Uh, and in the second part, I'll talk a bit about the modeling simulations, and there's a bit of Python in there. Keep it relevant. So it's about astronomy. Um, we want to do astronomy, and I need to explain this a little bit, what, what this is and what we want to do. Most people have this kind of picture in mind when you hear astronomy, so people staring through a telescope. Uh, that's not quite the state of the art anymore. So uh, for a while, we have bigger projects. So for, for you know, on one hand, it means fancier pictures like this one, and on the other hand means everybody just sits there typing on computers. So if you become an astronomer, you're not looking through anything, you're just staring at your computer as everybody else, okay? <laughs> so that's what I try to do when I do the kind of STEM talks to get people into science, you know what I mean? So um, the Hubble telescope is well known, uh, and uh, that is because we want to see more, you know, and to zoom in and understand more what it is. So if you see the night sky, there are some things like the moon and planets, but uh, most of these uh, little white dots are something else. So what do, you, what do you think what these white dots are? <laughs> say, say again? So what, what do we see? Stars. OK. So most of the things uh, you know, that are twinkling up there in the sky are stars. Well, not, not really. So if you... Um, if you zoom in with Hubble, then you, you can only look at one particular small thing. It's like a zoom lens. So if you zoom in on this one, that's the extreme deep field photo that uh, is very famous. And then you see in the patch before, there was not much to see anyway, just a few dots. And each of these dots is not a star. No, it's a million of stars in a galaxy or a cluster or um, something similar. So yeah, there are stars. All the light comes from stars, but they're much more out there than you would think. So each little dot that you see is typically not a star. So we've learned a lot using these instruments, but we need to find out more. And especially about the structure of the universe, how it evolved from the Big Bang to now, uh, there are still a couple of gaps in our theory. So most of the stuff we see is stars. Um, so have you ever thought about life and death of a star, <laughs> except from Death Star. So for most, for most people, stars are just there. I mean, in our time span, on the human time span, just stars don't do very much. They're just there. But on a cosmic time scale, that's completely different. They are born, they age, get fat, 
and then die. Um, <laughs> and depending on their initial mass, their um, age is very different. So uh, small stars, like our sun, last a very long time, whereas large and heavy stars burn very quickly and then explode quickly and um, leave behind typically some nebula from which you can form another star. But they also leave behind corpses. So most of them end up uh, having a very dense, heavy object left behind, which is not bright. So neutron stars or black holes are the things that I'm going to talk about in a second. So throughout this talk, I would like to give you some sense of the scale, physical scale of things, because that uh, in physics is quite normal, but uh, I don't know whether everybody appreciates the scale. So let's start with a star. The one we know is our sun. It's a gigantic fireball, so it's not a normal fire, it's a plasma fire, but it's just a ball of gas that's burning. And it's about 100 times the size of the Earth and 300,000 times the mass of the Earth. Well, that doesn't sound so impressive, 100 times larger, yeah. But if you show the picture, you know, that's Earth. Um, the little one is the moon, and that's the sun. So and we're not that close, although we, otherwise we would be burned very crisp. But I just want to show you how large this is. So keep in mind, a star is massive. It's huge and very heavy. So if the star at the end of its life uh, is heavier than the sun, so the sun would not collapse into a dark corpse like a black hole. Uh, if, if you're a little bit larger, so 1.5 times that, you would collapse into a neutron star or a black hole. So then all this mass just gets compressed very, very much. So this is the size of uh, something that used to be a little bit larger than the sun in the form of a neutron star. So for comparison, so that's where I live. Um, this is a 10 kilometer radius in Birmingham. So the entire huge fireball gets compressed into something which is just 10 kilometer wide if it's a neutron star and if it would shrink to a black hole a little bit more. So uh, who of you has seen the movie Interstellar? Very good, so you're experts on black holes. <laughs> Uh, because that is not from the movie, but uh, this is a proper science simulation. I can tell you that before that movie came out, nobody would have shown a black hole like this. Now all scientists show black holes like this. <laughs> and this is because the movie shown it like this. So this is a black hole and there's an accretion disk around it which glows because it's just gas get getting hot. And the light bending of the black hole makes this kind of funny, funny shape. Uh, by the way, one of the the person who probably wins the Nobel Prize for detecting gravitation waves is Kip Thorne from Caltech, and he wrote the original screenplay for Interstellar. Just so that you know. So uh, what, what are black holes? We don't really know. So they are basically things we can't see. What we mean by black hole is that everything has crunched together so much that nothing can escape the black hole. That means also no lights and no signal, which means we don't know what a black hole actually is, except that we can't see it. Okay, so the name comes from the fact that if you would look in the sky and there's a black hole somewhere, there's a black uh, hole in your picture, you can't see what's behind, okay? How do we know these exist? So mostly we know it from theory, but there is some evidence. So this is a movie, you see uh, years running up there, and this is looking into the center of our galaxy and tracking over many years the positions of stars. So an astronomer sitting down, you know, writing down the X and Y coordinates of the stars, for uh, more than 10 years, and then you can make this plot. And then you see they're doing um, orbits, trajectories around the center, in which we don't see very much. And then from the orbital mechanics, you can actually compute what should be in the center, and you know it must be very heavy and very compact, and the only thing we know that could do that is a black hole. Well, that's not very satisfying. That's the kind of evidence we have for black holes. This is one of these supermassive black holes in the center of galaxies, and there's some other evidence from X-ray uh, observations for smaller ones, but they're all indirect. So what we would like to do is see them directly, and there's one way. You might have heard of Einstein and uh, all his successes, <laughs> yes? So he's usually known for E equals MC squared. That's not his most famous thing. By the way, he got the Nobel Prize for something completely different. But uh, he wrote something about uh, 100 years ago, so 101 years exactly now. And um, here I can use my German, so it's called Die Grundlage der Allgemeinen Relativitätstheorie. And uh, this is the, the new theory of gravity, general relativity, in which he 
he wrote down new equations. Okay, the equations are it, but we try to imagine that with this kind of picture that space gets curved. So a mass into a space curves the space, and a curved space affects the other mass. Okay, and that's what this picture should show. Um, if you believe that, so that's uh, just a kind of picture, um, but it explains it quite well. Then imagine when you had two very happy things just circling each other, like two black holes orbiting around. Then they would change these bends of space time, and this bending would be rapidly changing. So this changes this kind of uh, gravitational field in space time so strongly that it, this distortion ripples away through space itself. So that's what we call a gravitation wave. And that comes purely as a prediction out of Einstein's theory of gravity. So what we would like to do is to learn more about dark, compact objects to do astronomy. Okay, because most of these stars, or millions of millions of millions, all end up as something dark and compact we cannot see. To understand how the universe evolves, we need to know more about these things. We want to see them directly, and not just by some evidence, but have signals directly. And we could do that with gravitation waves. So what we want to do is gravitation wave astronomy. And for that, we need a different instrument, because they're not light. So you can't take a picture. We need a different instrument to detect those. So the question is then, obviously, how do you detect gravitation waves? What do they do? So um, imagine there's a gravitation wave just coming through this uh, screen. And then you put some what we call test particles or something in a, in a circle here. Um, there are many just stacked behind. And what the gravitation wave would do is take this circle of masses and would squash it and stretch it in this kind of form. Okay, it's a wave that's passing through. And when it passes through, it changes the distance between objects. So ideally, you have to imagine that in, in space, they're free floating. They're not you know, bolted to the floor. And then these masses would change position. So to measure a gravitation wave, you would have to measure distance. And ideally, you would compare these two distances because one gets longer, the other gets shorter, and vice versa. So we need a new telescope, which doesn't take pictures of light, but measures a distance. So there are some instruments uh, to measure length. So the easiest one is to just take a meter stick and measure it. Um, but if you've read pub public magazine articles about Einstein, you know that's not the way to do it. Uh, in the theory of relativity, there's only one way to measure uh, distances, and that is by timing a photon. So I don't want to uh, explain that now. So I'll go back to Scientific American or something. They explained it quite nicely. That comes from the idea that nothing is uh, uniquely at the same time or simultaneous, but everything is relative relativity. And uh, so from there, with some arguments, you measure length only with light pulses. So you can buy one of these, and Wikipedia tells you they have uh, an accuracy of millimeters. This is quite nice you know, for renovating a kitchen, and, and this is good enough. <laughs> we need something slightly better, but we need to use the same trick, timing a light pulse. So there's an instrument for that, which is called interferometer. So here we have the two lengths we want to measure. And what we do is we take a, a light beam, shining it in, and splitting it so that it goes through the two lengths that we want to measure. These black things should be mirrors that reflect the light back. It comes to the central beam splitter and recombines and is detected by a photodetector. So what we do here is take light and just use uh, the light itself as a, as a reference. So we send them both uh, uh, along these arms and come back and then compare the time they've taken. Because with light, you can do interference. So if you, if you com compare uh, two of these light beams, when they are coming at the same time, um, the output will be bright. And if you change the timing a little bit, the output becomes dark. So that is just the same thing, but more accurate, because you don't need a clock. You use the light itself as a timing reference. So that's an old thing that was invented in 1887 by a person called Michelson. And we still call this the Michelson interferometer. So this is a mock-up of his original version. And it's interesting just to see what you could do with uh, an oil lamp, some mirrors, uh, metallic mirrors at the time. And uh, the photo detector was his eye. So he was staring into the thing and then uh, waiting for the output to change brightness. And then 
we call this complete change one fringe, and then you had to kind of see how how little brightness you can, you know, just judge by eye, whether it got a little bit darker, a little bit brighter, and Michelson thought he could do a percent of this range just by eye. And that's what he, uh, that's a famous experiment, actually, it's called Michelson Morley, and that is uh, actually the precursor for all this Einstein theory, is they wanted to test whether um, there is something called ether that's carrying light. So. Um, from this experiment that they didn't find the ether was the first steps towards that the speed of light is always constant, which is what Einstein used for his theory. Anyway, we just want the instrument to measure something like that. Now again, to length scales. So in physics, we throw out these numbers, 10 to the minus 20 and 10 to the 10 quite easily, and they have all nice names. But again, I would like to get uh, a little bit of appreciation about what these mean. So I have these six pictures. From one picture to the next, it's always a factor of 1,000 down. We start with a meter. That's easy. Everybody knows a meter. Well, you're in Britain, you know feet, but a meter. <laughs> then you go a factor of 1,000 down, you have millimeter. That's, again, easy. You can still see it. A factor of 1,000 down gets a bit more complicated. So what does this stand for? Micrometer. Micrometer. So it's a micron, it's a factor of 1,000 down from a millimeter that you can't see anymore, but you can go to B&Q and buy a so-called micrometer screw, and that is something where you put something in the middle and then you screw it uh, together and then you can measure its thickness down to a micrometer. So that's very nice. So usually when I do this with schools, they don't know this one and they don't know this one, but they all know nanometer because it's very famous. We can do nanotechnology. And that shows at the moment uh, here, just a funny example, it's a virus in a cage. So that's on a nanometer level, factor 1,000 down from a micrometer. And that's definitely not something we can see. You need special instruments for it. If I go down another factor, I get to PM. What does that stand for? <coughs> Picometer. So that's the last picture I can give you. There are two atoms sitting next to, next to each other. Uh, that's not a normal picture, obviously, but a special um, microscope used to that. So on a, on a picometer scale, you're down to single atoms, and when you go down one more, you're at femtometers. What could that be? Hmm? Yes, so femtometer, but what could this red dot probably be? A proton, yes. So from an atom, which is a, some core with electrons around it, you go just to the core, it's a factor of 1,000. Remember, atoms are empty space with uh, electrons flying around, and in the middle there's a small core. So that's femtometer. Okay, and then that is his length scale. So femtometer is here, 10 to the minus 15, nanometer, 10 to the minus 9, and so on. Now let's see what Michelson could do with his instrument in 1887. So he could measure down to here, nanotechnology. See, more than 100 years old. <laughs> Um, the question is now, what, what do we need? You know, what, what is uh, required to measure a gravitational wave? Is uh, femtometer, for example, what we want? Unfortunately not. So uh, gravitational waves that we expect to change distance, remember we put some masses there and then we measure the distance, we expect the, the length change to be, um, you know, down here. So that's a bit difficult. <laughs> but we have two instruments now that can do that. Um, so these are called LIGO. I'll tell you what that means in a second. There are two instruments in the US, one in Livingston, um, Louisiana, and one in Hanford in Washington State. And they are micro interferometers. So there are two arms here. There are also two arms. So they are the same kind of interferometer from its type, just a bit better and very long. And they have achieved a sensitivity of 10 to the minus 20 meters. That's, uh, I think, a million times a million better than the original Michelson one. And just tell you a few words how that works. So LIGO stands for Laser Interferometer Gravitation Wave Observatory. So that's what we want, a gravitation wave observatory, and we need a Michelson interferometer to do it. So we have two, so they're two large uh, interferometers, and I'll just show you a few pictures of one of them. And I picked the Hanford side. That's a very nice area. That's a former nuclear testing site and uh, still a waste disposal area. <laughs> so if you're interested in a new job, that's a very nice place to go. <laughs> um, but it's free land where you can build science projects on, otherwise you have a problem. So there's the central building, 
uh, building here uh, in which we host the laser and some of the optics. Then there's these long tubes um, in which the laser beam propagates, and there will be also buildings at the end. So if you go to Google Earth and look from the, from the top, it looks like this, a bit dark. Uh, if we make that a big, bit brighter, then you just see these are roads, this is the central building, and these are the tubes. So to give you a sense of scale, these things are four kilometers long. So I took a picture of London. So I think here's Buckingham Palace, King's Cross, we're somewhere here. So there's a lot of space there, <laughs> very empty. Um, so these are huge. So they're not doing very much, it's just a long arm, but they're very, very long. Now looking at the, the arm itself, so if, if you take one of these elements here, and I just show you a picture for the scale. So these are vacuum tubes, so there's just metal tubes so that you have nothing inside, because uh, the laser beam that travels back and forth would be distorted by air vibration, so you pump the air out. You make uh, this size tubes. Then at the end of the, the tunnel, so um, you get to what we call the end station. It's a small building. And at that end station, then you would have uh, a vacuum tank, which is uh, something like this, where from the round thing, you connect the tube. Okay? And um, if you look inside that, now you're inside the vacuum tank. There's obviously no vacuum because there are people. Uh, so you, you, you first have the people in there installing stuff, and then when they're all gone, then you pump down and you get vacuum. So there's uh, complicated things. Unfortunately, I don't have time to explain all this. And there is this piece of glass down here. And that piece of glass is the actual mirror. Okay, so that thing, we want to measure how much it moves. And we want to see something that it doesn't move more than 10 to the minus 19 meter. So all this kind of structure here is to keep that very quiet. And for that, I have to refer to you my next talk. Um, so what happened? Um, on the 14th of September, we, with these instruments, measured for the first time a gravitation wave. And this is the data um, recorded by this instrument. So the instruments have basically each one channel. So it's not like CERN, where, where we have these terabytes of data flowing out all the time. We have one channel uh, sampled at some tens of kilohertz. And usually they don't do much because everything is quiet. And then on that day, we saw this wiggle. And we saw the wiggle in the two instruments, so there's one and the other, uh, overlapping exactly right. So there, here time shifts it by the different arrival times, a few milliseconds. So they overlap exactly. These are the models we get from Einstein. So these are the predictions from Einstein theory. And here's the residuals if you subtract those from the data. And here's the time frequency plot where you have on the x-axis still time. And here's just the frequency of the signal. And here you, you see this shape. It's a chirp. So in all these outreach talks, we call this a whoop. Okay. <laughs> um, that's what we were looking for. And it was immediately there. Okay, So no fancy data people needed. Okay, It was just there. Yay. <laughs> Uh, of course, then we have to do a lot of data analysis to show the significance, uh, uh, look for whether it was a, uh, just statistical um, you know, glitch and all these kind of things. And uh, after all this, we published the result. But it was really loud and clear. So what we do from there, we reconstruct what this should have been. And this is the video of it. Let me just speed this up a little bit. Um, so what you have here on the bottom, it's hard to see, but this is kind of the wiggle in the data, and it becomes blue while we go through the video to see where in the signal we are. And you see the whole thing happens in a fraction of a second, so we're only going through uh, less than a, a second here. So these are two black holes uh, circling around each other. Just They have do, been doing this for a million of years, but now they're getting so close that they're going to crash. And this is the strength. The, this bottom colorful plot shows the strength of the gravitational field. So if I keep this running, uh, then you see how they get closer. And you see this kind of wavy pattern that already gravitation waves are leaving that area of space. And when we get closer uh, to the actual final crash and merger, you see that the signal becomes um, stronger. And now just, just before the actual event, it gets really uh, very crazy around here. This is the most energetic event in the universe we know of. And at some point, the two just merge. That's just a uh, kind of 
switch because we don't know really what happens. We just say we cannot describe the, them as two anymore. We have to describe them as one. And afterwards, we have a single black hole of which we hear nothing ever after because it's quiet. The only thing that we can sense is this kind of very violent uh, event in the middle and these waves going away. Okay, so that's what we've, what we've done in, as a kind of funny compu computer simulation, but the facts. So a billion years ago, which means it was a billion light years away, get that? Light years is distance, okay. <laughs> um, there were two black holes, about 30, uh, 36 times our, uh, the mass of our sun and 29 times the mass of our sun. Then they inspire, that means they get close and then they crash, they form one black hole, which is 62, so there's a few solar masses missing because you lose that as energy. And uh, that is one of these most violent events. You can already imagine that, these kind of things that are heavy, uh, like 60 times our stars, and they're orbiting each other at 200 hertz, means 200 times a second. You know, imagine your kitchen blender, like, <laughs> just a bit bigger, okay? So that <laughs> is really, really uh, hard to imagine. And what then happens a billion years later, they wiggle our mirrors by well, 10 to the in, uh, minus 18 meters for 0.1 seconds. Okay, that's roughly the timeline. And that means I get talks like this. I, uh, <laughs> I, win, I win a lot of prizes and so on. Okay, so second part, now I have to speed up a little bit because I don't have as much time as I thought. But I would like to give you a little bit of an insight about how we build these things. And I'm working especially on the optics experimentally. And uh, what we do is do uh, numerical simulations for which we use Python and so on. So let me just give you a, a few glimpses of that. First of all, we are a huge collaboration. So there are 1,000 authors currently working on the project that are on the paper. And these are all the, the universities involved. So it's, a, it's one of these big science projects. And uh, for the interferometry, what we do is we take the simple concept that I showed you before and work on it. And this is a kind of sketch how it looks today. There are lots of things we had to do. Uh, just show you what are uh, one of the few things that actually make it better. So you get better signals the longer you get. That's why these things are four kilometer long. Then uh, a lot of these things are um, increasing. So the signals increase with laser power. So we ramp up the laser power, and that you do by better lasers, uh, but also by having what we call optical cavities, optical resonators, in which the power increases. And then there's another thing that you want to do is filter. So passive filters are good to just get noise down. And again, you can use optically the same thing as optical cavities and resonators. So that's why the whole thing starts to look complicated. Unfortunately, I can't explain the details. I just want to get across the sense of complexity that we built in. So it's getting much better, but it's unfortunately getting much more complex. And to give you um, just a sense of what I'm, what I'm missing out, most of the work is actually on each component to make it not shaking. So the mirror especially needs to be quiet to 10 to the minus 80 meters, so that is the real achievement, okay? But I can't talk about that. So, but uh, just the, uh, because I want to talk about the optics. Um, so this little symbol here, this half circle with a line is a standard symbol uh, you use for a photo detector. And you can buy a photo detector online for a quit, that's a photo detector. But what I mean, what we mean by this is obviously just kind of a subsystem. So that photo detector, that detector looks like this. So this is the main interferometer beam, and then it goes into optomechanics here and more optomechanics here. You see it's split into several beams because we have to optimize how we detect it for its high power. We have to have auxiliary beams for control and all this kind of thing. So each of the little, little symbols in the diagram before is a huge subsystem. So we developed those over many years. So when you start thinking, okay, how do I make a better detector? You hear, I have an idea. Then physicist, you get out some pieces of paper, do some math, you know, see whether the ideas work. And then the key aspects are these two things, tabletop and prototype tests, where you have an interferometer this size, in my lab I have some of these, and then we have 10 meter size prototypes to see whether that uh, idea that you have is practically doable. However, that is very expensive and takes a lot of time. So that in parallel, we run <coughs> code to try to speed that up, to find out, especially if it, an idea is bad. So most of my job is running simulations saying, hmm, no, mm -mm, no. No. Okay. Shoot down ideas quickly so that the ones that you have to test on an experiment are fewer. Okay, that's the job. 
Optics is at least for me easy to model because everything is linear in terms of equations and math. I have some light fields that are complex numbers, then I have some optics that are as a black box, but it's linear equations, and then I get some light out. And for example, all these optical cavities and resonators I was talking about are just two mirrors facing each other. And then you can write down you know, the sketch, then you write down a set of linear equations, you form this into a matrix, you can solve the matrix, and when you solve a matrix for a particular input vector <coughs> where you say, okay, the light comes from there, you get all the fields at every node as an output. So by just solving a simple matrix equation, you know all the optical fields everywhere, also in the output, so that's what you want. And to plot something, you would solve this matrix, then tune the parameter a little bit, solve it again, you know, tune the parameter, solve it again. Okay, so, and luckily uh, these form space, uh, so optical systems form sparse matrix, uh, a matrix that is sparse, very similar to a linear circuit. So for that, you have obviously a lot of code available. Unfortunately, we can use none, but we have to write our own because um, we need to really adapt it to our problem. So most people that do modeling do this mistake that they either do it like this or like that. So either they want to model everything you know, you have in the computer the real world, and then you stare at the computer and say, wow, that's complicated. I don't understand what it's doing, okay? And then you just recreated your problem that you don't understand what it's doing. <laughs> but that doesn't help you. It usually also runs 10 times slower than real-time experiments, so it's just worse. Okay, that's what we've done and luckily thrown away. Um, I think most people went through this phase. Then the other one is you use fundamental concepts only. You say, okay, I can reduce it to uh, you know, first principles and so on. And then you get, get a nice, clean, elegant math and everything looks right. However, that actually then doesn't reproduce the problem that you're investigating. So typically something is going wrong with your experiment and you want to find what, but your model is always perfect, okay? So what we need to do is kind of find the right level of, of abstraction. So that is not a coding problem. It's not a number crunching, you need the right library. No, it's, it's this kind of thinking of how to formulate the problem. And because we built this instrument for the first time, we can ask nobody. We just do it, we do it wrong, okay? We do it again, we do it wrong, we do it, and so on. So we are still in a learning process how to do this right when we actually write and use our models. So that's a good bit. Um, the bad bit is this one. <coughs> so we write our own code, but we are non uh, educated in that business at all. So typically, I'm an experimental physicist, I had a problem, and I thought, okay, I need some code. Then I'm writing it myself, um, which then causes all these problems. So I'm my own user, that's good, because I know what I want, but I'm the only user typically for a long time. Uh, so that doesn't help me finding bugs. Then I don't know anything about coding practices at all. But now I know a little bit, but it's 10 years later. So the code is awful uh, in all ways. And then uh, my biggest problem was always this one, because real physicists don't use simulations. So you have the theorists on this side that, that want to understand it mathematically, pure math, nothing else. And you have the experimentalists on the other side that say, no, I have to see it working here. Because it's so easy to make a plot, which what the simulator is doing. Uh, and everybody has come to these other two people and say, oh, of all these plots, I can tell you. And later on uh, realized that the simulator didn't understand the problem. So there's a real problem getting a team to listen to the person who did the model. So over the years, we got better with that, but that, I think, is the biggest challenge. Um, so I wrote some code uh, when I was a PhD student, 97, and uh, it's in C at that time. I didn't know better. Um, it's, it's a lot of code. It's open source, and we still use it, and actually lots of people use it, and that's good, because now I have lots of users. And it's very simple. So what you do is you write in a text file just uh, some cryptic sy syntax that I invented. One line, <laughs> one line is a command or a component. Take your pick. <laughs> then you open up a terminal, and then you type the name of the binary and that of the of the file. And it runs and it produces a text file as an output. That's it. Okay, that's what my code does. But it writes batch files for uh, GNUplot, uh, MATLAB, and Python that you can call and then get a plot. Okay, so there's some user friendliness in here. So you get a plot. 
And that's what we want. We want very quick, so it takes a second. You see, I mean, this is really no time at all. What I want is to do this, and then I change the number, and I do it again, and I change the number. So I want to play. Okay, that's what we still do. I just want to play. No number crunching, just play. So and, um, now, I mean, my, my software should actually be only for people that using laser interferometers at the level of 10 to the minus 20 meters. There are only 100 of those <laughs> on the planet. <laughs> I don't know why I still get three, 4,000 downloads every time. Um, <laughs> There they are, mostly they track actually our projects. That, that is us, this is us, this is us, this is mostly us here and here, and these are too. So I kind of guess where some of these users come from, but I don't know where the others come from. But I get Newton bug reports and that's very nice. So then around this kind of C binary that doesn't do much, you need some more, some more powerful stuff. So we wanted to write some scripting stuff around it to automate task pre-process data, post-process data. And we started to doing that in MATLAB. And that was because uh, the project had decreed MATLAB is the standard, okay? And then that was 2006, I wrote a lot of tools to do all this in MATLAB. And in 2013, I uh, jumped ship and did this again in Python. And um, th the reason was, I mean, so MATLAB has been, you know, kind of losing some ground even within the project. And the reason was not everybody gets a license. So you have a few people in the project that can run stuff and the others just, hmm, okay. So that was not really good because it really limits what you can do with your software. And then most of the scripting we want to write around is text parsing for, for, for which MATLAB is terrible. <laughs> so uh, we didn't like that. And then new students coming in, they all want to use Python. Okay, so the, yeah, the cool people coming into Caltech and so on, all from the Bay Area uh, in our project, they all want to use Python, and uh, they really put some pressure on the older guys saying, oh, we have to use MATLAB. So it got more easy to do it, and you know, for me, the main reason why I like it is that it pr provides, you know, notice the now stability. So uh, now it provides the right mix of stability and still being able to play with it. Okay. And the, the outcome is uh, another set of tools we call PyCat, and uh, mostly we use it in IPython notebooks to run uh, you know, the other binary. And we try to uh, be very slim, so we only use the standard packages that most scientists use, so mostly NumPy and some of the others, obviously. So I don't have much time, but I want to show you a quick example of what we actually do. So usually we, we run a lot of things for designing and so on, but what is interesting when you actually have something already running and want to find out what's wrong. So go back in time, very long way, when we didn't have money, so we had to clone ourselves. That's, uh, <laughs> that's an actual control room of an actual gravitational wave detector about 15 years ago, <coughs> and me, a couple of times. And what we wanted to see there is a control signal that looks like this blue line um, to control the interferometer. So before it was working, but after it was installed. But what we got most of the time is a signal like this. And then I started modeling by comparing what I saw. I saw a beam that looked like this. And you know laser beams should be round. Okay, everybody knows that. So that was wrong. And I coded in my simulations errors until I got in my simulation something that was wrong as well. I said, okay, nice. But I still uh, didn't have exactly what I wanted. And I saw this kind of roundness was wobbling up and down. And I then tried to code um, that in that this motion we knew existed. And then is my simulation wobbling the beam up and down like it looked on my TV screen in the control room. And with that, I could reproduce this and then looked at the code, what errors I had to put in to recreate that. And then we went to the tank, opened it, and fixed it. So it's one of the, and not too many examples where that works so cleanly, but one of the examples where we really found through simulation something quicker. And uh, similarly to, to beam shapes, um, these mirrors that I showed you before, and this is a corrective coating on it, and this will take it off later. It needs to be very, very flat. And these mirrors cost several hundred thousand dollars. So what you want is that you have some way of testing it before you hand over the money. So when you buy, <laughs> when you buy the mirrors, the manufacturer gives you a measurement of the surface, and then we run the simulations to um, actually determine whether it's good or not, and we used my software to determine whether LIGO pays the mirrors or not. Well, all fine, we paid. All good. <laughs> So, and uh, something you can have looked for yourself, uh, just some links. So we do a lot of teaching with these notebooks now as well. So we have run summer schools where everything is IPython based. And let's show you the links. So um, we have this uh, public on GitHub and we 
host a static HTML version on my web page because we think in GitHub is too slow if people want to interact and click through, so we just converted everything once and uploaded it to the web page. And um, just at the end, is it good? I think yes. So for us, this has been a, a good experience. Um, we got what we need. There are just a few problems with it. So uh, installation is non-trivial. So even though it got better, for non-programmers, for non-coders, for non-data scientists, it's still a disaster, okay? And that limits my use of this because I have to convince an experimental physicist of what I'm doing is right, and they want to try it. So that's bad. Uh, at the moment, uh, um, this, is, this is on the way up. I think it's just tricky at the moment to sometimes with the packages two and three and so on. And then there's one thing which is called Simulink in MATLAB that we have no replacement for, which really stops us because we, we need this a lot. And then if you are actually more interested in data, which I know you are, uh, there are other stuff. Uh, so just two examples of use of Python. So one is Jamie Rollins, is him, uh, wrote a nice paper about uh, distributed state machine to control the instrument. You can find that on the archive. So my slides are on the web anyway. You can find all these links later. And then uh, what they talked about before, all our data is open, and there is an IPython notebook that explains how to do all the data analysis. So and if you want to know more about LIGO, there's a very easy way of doing that. There's a magazine, um, LIGO Org magazine, which has all the stuff in there. It's a free PDF that comes out every six months, and it's really nice. It's not for you. It's for us. So it's full of jargon. But at the same time means you can see what we're doing. So it's not PR, it's not advertising, it's just for us, but you can download it and read it. Okay, and with that, my time is finally up. Thank you very much. Goosebumps, literal goosebumps. Literal goosebumps, that was, that was, that was brilliant. brilliant. Thank you <laughs> very much. Brilliant. <laughs> um, yeah, super excited by that. So we're going to take questions in just a moment, and I'm going to thank Andreas for compressing the talk ever so slightly. Uh, so we're running a few minutes late, so by way of admin, could the speakers for the next room, please? That's uh, Kieran, Frank and Giles, and Annabelle. Go to your rooms and get set up, uh, and then Marco, you're just going to have to jump on stage and perform a magic act and get set up really quickly when we're done. Um, I think that was my main bit of, uh, oh yeah, and everyone check the schedule because the online schedule is uh, a bit different to what it was yesterday. So if you want to know which rooms you're going to be in, check the online schedule. Um, and then we'll take a few minutes of questions and then we'll do a room swap. So nobody else leave, just the speakers. <laughs> um, it, oh, and uh, oh, Wi-Fi codes, get them from the front desk. They're available on the front desk, so get those when you've left the room afterwards. Right, over to Andreas for a couple of minutes for questions. Do we have any questions for Andreas? Uh, Ian? <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, so the question, uh, well, to rephrase the question, why are there two instruments and uh, is there a connection be between them? Is that, yeah. yeah. So I didn't really say that we need two because um, and gravitation wave detector is like a microphone. So you, you only really just hear a sound, but you don't know where it's coming from. So you need two to do like something like stereo sound to triangulate but also because uh, we do it for the first time. That was the first ever detection. We need to convince people that what we're doing is right. So how do you, can you distinguish that somebody just kicked your tank or it was a gravitation wave? So you do two of them uh, and then monitor the environment very carefully so that you can compare the two and do a correlation analysis. So now there's no connection between the two except that we timestamp with GPS data what we do on both sides. Yes, we didn't, we didn't point. So the question was, how do we know that the black holes were from actually from there, from the southern hemisphere, and how we could we point our detectors in this way? We didn't. So we're omnidirectional, and we're just hoping that something happens. So <laughs> we, we believe some event like this on this strength happens once a month. We just didn't have the detector to measure it. So we believe from now on. So at the moment, we're again in maintenance mode because we've just switched on. We're still working on the detector. But we believe this one will be just coming from all over the sky. And we're just monitoring the entire sky. Um, Yeah, there are future detectors. Yes. Um, so 
the question was uh, for future detectors, whether we can do something longer, go on Mars and so on. Uh, so what I was talking about was one type of detector. There are others in the planning. So one is space-based. Uh, it's 50, kilometer, 50 million kilo kilometer long. Uh, so you don't go on a planet because that's noisy. Each planet is noisy. You go away from planets to go into space. And this mission um, is going to go to different frequencies. So it's like different telescopes. We don't actually compete, but we just fill different slots. So that's in the works. And they're also using normal telescopes, um, radio telescopes, to do even larger ones where the noise requirements are all different for each of these. But yeah, that's in the works. Yeah, so the question was, uh, well, uh, there was a statement that it was bit by chance because when we switched it on, we immediately saw something and how often does that happen? Uh, so it's true, we, we actually saw this before we switched to science mode, that was amazing. Um, so we were ready for the next day um, and when the signal came, we detected it before. But that's because since uh, we run LIGO since 2000 and just upgrading it steadily, whenever we go home, we switch to science mode. So even though we were officially waiting to start a science run, you know, we were always in science mode to some extent. <laughs> How often does that happen? So we increase the sensitivity all the time. So we believe it happens all the time. We just now reach the threshold where we can see them. And as I said, I think we, this one will be once a month, roughly. So we've seen one. We've seen one. We are still analyzing the data for a second uh, bit of data, which we will publish in a month from now. I can't tell you more about that. Then we're in maintenance mode at the moment, and we're going to start the next uh, science run with better sensitivity in a month or two. And um, this goes on for another three years until we reach the, the design sensitivity and then run continuously. And when, when I'm talking about the, the, the rates, it's the final one. So in three years, we think we're just running, and we get uh, continuous uh, signals every month. 